All right, so uh, hello and welcome to the eighth episode of the Awesome Algo podcast. Today's guest is Patrick Bennett. He is a CEO at a company called TXN Lab. TXN Lab Inc. is a development company that is basically focused on building Web3 applications on Algorand. And um, Patrick has a very extensive experience in software engineering industry of basically covering nearly four uh, decades. And uh, we're certainly going to uh, spend uh, a brief first part to touch on his biography and the story behind founding of the TXN Lab. Uh, but of course, the main topic of the episode is going to be focused around the main product offering by TX, TXN Lab called NF Domains. As always, I did my due diligence to prepare for this episode by getting familiar with the product and reviewing the documentation that is kindly provided uh, through Gitbook. And uh, we have a lot of interesting topics to cover in this episode. And uh, with that, let's proceed. Uh, first of all, Patrick. Thank you very much for coming to the show. You know, I'm very happy we found some time to accommodate this episode. And it's incredible to have another CEO representing a prominent platform in the Algorand ecosystem. So tell me a bit about yourself and, uh, you know, how you got into engineering in the first place. And we got plenty of time for each section, so don't feel constrained or yeah. rushed to <laughs> um, answer yeah, big, big topics. Huh? Um, yeah, I, it's Patrick Bennett, as you mentioned, uh, CEO, co-founder of Transaction Lab. Um, how I got into software engineering? Um, well, um, it goes back to when I was pretty young, um, like nine or ten or something like that. And it was it was uh, there was a school I was at. I was going to go to middle school, and I and I found out that a, a different school that I potentially had a chance to go into had computers um at the time you didn't wasn't really didn't really have that um and i don't recall how i got kind of that wild hair of sorts but i decided uh, on the day of signing up for school with my with my parents as they're going in the line i decided i don't want to go here i want to go to this other school and they're like, "What?" I, I made a big scene and still my feet like, no, I'm, I'm not going to go here. And so I'm going to go into a different school and um, because they had computers. And so um, I, uh, they had like a, uh, in the science class, I think sixth grade, they had three or four Tandy TRS-80 Model 1s. And it was like an elective thing at the end of, end of the school day where the teacher would just like give you a book and just like play. Here you go, play. There was no, you weren't taught or anything. And so I just started with a programming book, learned to program and started coding. And, you know, quickly was creating games and things for other students to play in the classrooms. And then that was back when you had to start with our cassette tapes on those particular computers, they had 4K of RAM and would uh, load them up between periods and then students would play the, play the games and I had to like reload them for them at different times because they'd get reset first for class stuff. But um, yeah, so I, I um, started programming from you know around 10 and um, then progressed to, um, you know, we got the original IBM PC when it came out. Um, it was 16K of RAM, upgraded to 64K of RAM uh, with two floppies, a CGA monitor, and uh, Epson dot matrix printer, I think. And at the time that was like, I mean, I, I look back at what my parents spent on that. It was like $6,000 in 1980, you won. So it was a significant investment. Um, but, you know, my parents could clearly tell that like, this was my thing. Like I was just consumed by it. And so any programming books, I would hit the bookstores, I would get programming books, I was going to like a, a user group, a local user group meeting, and someone handed me a uh, k and uh, C programming language book and like, here, you know, learn this. C, C is the, the new cool thing. And there was like speakers coming to our users group that were 
now quite notable people. You know, there were authors at the time who were just trying to get their books known. And here's a, a book on C or whatever, and come and speak. And it's like, okay, this seems cool. And I was probably 13 when doing that. And so I learned C and um, wrote like a uh, programmer's editor, a C programmer's editor that I released as shareware. I think that was from like 14 or 15 maybe. And then I'd learn assembly mm -hmm. um, because um, as, you, as, you, as you displayed uh, um, text on the screen, if you just, you basically had to uh, push the bytes to, it was basically that the screen was directly addressable where you had a, a byte for the character and then uh, byte for the color, foreground, background color and flash and stuff like that. So basically, you would just uh, assemble um, the the image and and throw the bytes to the memory buffer of the the screen. But then, if you did it during the the refresh, it would sparkle. You get these sparkles. It would be like snow on the screen. They called it. So then you had to kind of learn some assembly because you had to to watch a particular um, memory address or register. For when the the uh, the monitor was in the process of refreshing, so it was a CRT. Mm -hmm. So as it's as a scan aligns right before it goes back up and redisplays the screen, you had to wait until that moment when it's getting ready to go back up, up and and redisplay the screen, and you'd throw everything into the buffer during that period, so that that way, as you scrolled through your editor and page up and page down and stuff, it was it was like instantaneous. So yeah, then I got into like programming with a mouse and you had to do the hard work hard for that. And just went from there. But yeah, so I started young and uh, learned everything I could. I, I warned you, I, I can get I can get sidetracked pretty easily. So I apologize. But no, yeah, no worries. It, I mean, this, this, it was a, this is definitely was something I, yeah, I, I, it was basically started very young and it was something that was just clicked for me. I, I liked creating things you know i liked being able to write software and like have something produced from it you know and it, it whether it was something that was just fun for myself but i really also enjoyed creating things other people enjoyed you know mm -hmm. so that was that was the most fun you know like if i wrote it they wrote a game or something like that the other students were really into that was that was really cool so like i even had would send up hand out graph paper to students to help design levels and uh you know for one of my games that was kind of like a pitfall sort of game so i had people design different levels and i told them like certain sort of symbols would be certain triggers in the game and i would tell them how to do that and then i have them do levels for me uh, awesome pretty cool stuff that's uh you know also great to highlight the fact that uh you know it's it's always amazing to see when uh, you know parents are very supportive of uh uh, things that kids are uh, interested in and uh, they sort of and then, uh, in this feel day, their my passions. Dad, you know, it's very important. Yeah. yeah, but my dad's much older now, and he'll he'll still say quite a bit. He's like, you know, it's the best investment he ever made um, because it, you know, at the time it was a lot, but it, that was because it was so clearly my passion. Um, I'm just, you know, uh, thankful that that my parents, you know, saw that and supported it. Um, and uh you know i just it went from there for my entire career awesome awesome yeah thanks thanks for sharing those insights and, uh, <laughs> i went back very you asked when i started that's when i started <laughs> <laughs> i guess uh, going a bit further um what would be also very interesting to hear like your first exposure or i guess your first fascination with uh distributed systems in general because i think it's a uh, it's a useful prerequisite for uh blockchain systems and uh after that, uh, would would be um, great uh, to to hear, you know, how you first got introduced to our grant ecosystem and how. Yeah, I mean, you, to, to varying to varying degrees, you know, depending on what sort of development you do, you, you had to be exposed to to um, you know network uh, topologies and design um, to, to a certain extent pretty early on. Like um, like one of the first things I wrote for like a small print shop. And this was in the early eighties. Um, they would uh, fax quotes to customers and they were one of the few that would do it electronically. And Intel had a, a fax board and 
it was just, it was a, an ISA card that had to be in a specific computer that it's, it was a hardware board. They had phone lines into it and they could send faxes. Well, um, I had to write a TSR, a Terminate State Resident Driver or DOS that ran the computer. And then I used at the time NetBIOS, I think, to basically, I had to write, you know, networking code to allow all the other computers in his system run my software as well for his or, or management software so that they could send faxes from any computer. But so I had to have a, 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 a TSR running on this one computer that acted as, uh, you know, a, a server of sorts for being able to, to relay and send faxes. Um, and then that was very, very, very early. Um, and then, you know, you didn't even have um, TCP IP really stacks. Like it used to be, you actually had to pay money to even have IP as a stack. On, on so, a sorry, this is once again, late, uh, late 80s. This was, this would have been, uh, so it was the Intel FX board. So this would have been 1985 or six, maybe. Mm. Oh yeah. Um, and so that would have been, I'm trying to think which networking was being used at that time, but it was, um, uh, it wasn't turning, it was like a coax based and that was, um, I'm trying to think it was a star configuration. But basically, you had to to connect all the computers in line, basically, um, and it was it was interesting. But so you know that was very early on, and kind of having to kind of do my own sort of network programming to a to a great extent. Um, but then later on, I was I went into consulting, doing um, consulting for early on. It was the the big thing, the big rage was client server databases. Um, so. Um, you know, then that's more, you're really dealing with those protocols. Um, then from consulting, I worked for, um, in consulting, I went, worked for a uh, telecommunications uh, software company for 18 years called, called Interactive Intelligence that made, um, you know, basically really sophisticated um, call center software, you know, for really, like large enterprises, large call centers. And, um, a lot of what I did was more systems level uh, programming, um, you know, just low level C++. Um, but then, um, you know, an example of project I worked on there was um, something for um, it was like an early, uh, for, uh, an early um, service that predated, you know, a lot of, you know, this is well before iPhone, all that kind of things. And before you really even had necessarily good IP or um, on the phones. So um, the first clients that were supported with this um, application, basically you would basically with a drag and drop environment kind of create an interface um, and be able to push it out to mobile clients that, and they could then interact with all of the company's backend tools. And so you That's could... It. Uh, handle phone calls, all of that from your BlackBerry. So I Im ended up implementing TCP/IP effectively on top of the BlackBerry um, data network, which was basically like pager based. So it, it was, you know, in, in a sense, it's like the the BlackBerry packet messages were almost more like treat like UDP because they're not guaranteed. And then I had to implement a you know a, an IP uh, like um, retry and, and sequencing um, mechanism on top of that so that you could get um, reliable reliable um, uh, reliable network on the, the BlackBerry devices and be able to run like full applications on them with uh, bi-directional data. And so, um, yeah, and then as far as our, our network services within our application, I've done, been done, I've been involved in network programming for a long time. Mm -hmm. So that kind of goes, it, it, it falls in line with um, supplies for me in general. It's just, it's a lot of times it's a networking issue, mm -hmm. right? I see. And I suppose after this introduction, this uh, also certainly leads us into, um, I guess, more specific topics of uh, one particular application of distributed systems called blockchain. So, um, when we speak of blockchain, I guess it would be um, 
interesting to hear your first experience with uh, Algorand in general. Um, I know that um, NFD domains was uh, one of the uh, winners of the grant from Algorand Foundation, and uh, there was some um, significant support uh, in that regard. And uh, but I'm I'm really curious to hear the story before that, uh, like what uh, uh, led you to you know uh, start uh, the TXN lab in general and. Uh, the decision making behind picking NFD domains as your sort of first main uh, offering. My first, my first exposure to Algorand was I was going to a GopherCon conference, which is a you know Go programming language conference. And I attend every single year. This was in San Diego that year, which I think was um, twenty um, nineteen. Um, maybe 2020, yeah, it was like I think it was 2019, and it was like late 2019. And usually, I go like the day before, to, I, I usually go to like the, those full day like classes, the full day courses, and just find a topic before the conference. So, I was there the night before that, and I was like, What can I do? And I was looking, I saw on meetup.com there was a blockchain meetup, and uh, there was a blockchain meetup for Algorand, and uh, Jason Mothersby. Uh, was there talking about he ended up talking about Algorand, and it was a very small meetup. There was maybe like eleven people there, right? It was like and a very Jason informal. From, uh, Devril, Jason right? Mothersby, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. he's the okay. head of developer relations at, at Inc. And so, um, yeah, he was up there talking. He was at, talking about Algorand, and I had at that time um, already. I think I was already running a Bitcoin node. I was already pretty familiar with Bitcoin. Um, I was looking at Cosmos, like Cosmos had a booth at GopherCon, for example. Um, they're definitely, they're courting Go developers, uh, cause it's also written in Go. A lot of, a lot of the chains are. Um, and, um, I think I already, I think I already had like some Cosmos swag or something that was carrying. I don't know. And, um, so I went to that, I knew nothing about Algorand, never even heard of it. And. He Jason's talking about it. It's unique consensus and all these great things about it and how fast it is and all of that. And at the time, I didn't. I had it was basically it was coming. I was coming in cold, so I knew nothing about it. And to have kind of like a you know a, a, a slide deck where someone kind of walks through it, you're kind of like uh, okay, you know. And so I, I I listened to it, but I didn't really get any of it. I didn't. It just didn't register, but it kind of planted the seed that at least I was familiar and knew the word algorand and could place it like, oh yeah. And so I want to say that I was um, working about the forty minute commute each way um, at at the, the 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 big cloud company I was working at the time, and um, I would listen to podcasts on the way to and from uh, work. And I remember listening to um, maybe Unchained, one of those. It's one of the podcasts where they talked to Silvio for a, a good amount of time. And Would it be it the was, Alex Friedman one? It, no, 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 no. That, that, mm. was, that was quite recently. This was, this was in like 2019, mm -hmm. 2019 or, um, or, or maybe very early 2020. All right. And it was a, a, a really good ch chat with Silvio where he actually went into detail about um, like partition attacks against Bitcoin. He, we kind of talked about, the, you know, pros and cons of Bitcoin, um, how it's not partition resistance and why. Talked about the consensus of, of Algorand and how that worked. And then the, the interviewers were, were technical and were asking kind of pointed technical questions about, well, oh, well, then couldn't they, you know, influence the blocks to, to, to influence the committee and this and this? And Silvio like, oh, no, no, no. And, you know, he went into full detail like as Silvio did. And it was a fantastic podcast. And I think that um, listening to that and then having that kind of little earworm still from before where I had been to the meeting, I was like, you know what? I, I need to look at Algorand. And I think I was already running a Cosmos node at that time as well. And I um, downloaded the, the, the node, built it uh, from source, um, started running it, 
like the configuration, like in general, compared to other nodes and things to the Cosmos, like the setup and configuration of the Algorand node was like light years better than Cosmos. Like Cosmos, you had to find like the magic blog post and you'd go through like three or four or five levels deep and find like, oh, I need to, I need to add these particular IP addresses and nodes to this config file to bootstrap. And, and, and like they, they changed and moved around. So it's like, it, it was, it took a little bit to get it up and running. Whereas for Algorand, the, the, the at least I felt, um, the documentation was fantastic. Um, you know, there's some, some little things missing, but like overall, I got the node up and running very quickly. Um, and then I wanted to learn more about, okay, like I want to make a consensus so I can, I can, you know, stake my algo, right, algo and set a participation key. And so I set a participation key. Then I was like, well, how do I know I'm really participating, right? Like, yeah, I have a participation key, but is it really working? I wanted to know, right? And it's like, oh, well, like that would, I was asking in the, in, the, in the Discord. And at that time, it was, it, was, it was very, very, very quiet. You know, I was like, well, active people there. And so I was asking like, well, how does this work? How does this work? Or like, how do I know it's broadcast? How do I know it's proposing? Like, and they would like, I oh, check this. And I would grab the log and I would see it. I was like, yeah, I don't trust it. Like, just because my local machine says it proposed, did I actually propose? Like, did anyone else in the world see my proposal, mm -hmm. right? So then I started like digging into the code, right? Like I wanted to like, figure it out like okay i want to like it's going through the code we went through the source and each kind of question i asked i usually would go through the source to try to answer it and i ended up writing like code to like um fetch you know like look at all the blocks you know, I, I ran an archival node so i would look at every single block and analyze it and i would look to, to verify that the blocks that were actually proposed and stored did they you know match my expectations mm -hmm. like were mm -hmm. were my votes in that block were mm -hmm. my proposals in that block so if i proposed am i seeing my proposals right is you know so i was basically like looking at the, the blocks and seeing did i actually propose something here like I it see. says i proposed but was it actually accepted i want to see that acceptance it says i voted do i actually see that vote and you know, there's the, the proposal step, the soft votes, and the certification votes. Well, the certification votes are stored in the block. Um, but what's interesting is is they're not, they're going to be stored in the block for each node, but be specific to each node. Mm -hmm. So that's something kind of, you know, you kind of learn. It kind of makes sense when you think about it in terms of distributed, uh, you know, distributed programming, networking. Um but, you know, talking to other node runners, I was like, you know, hey, what's your block look like? Okay, what, what are your votes? Well, how, that's weird. How come, how come your, your count, your votes are different than mine? Well, then you kind of, you worked out that, oh, it makes sense. Well, because the timing, like you received yours in a different order and yours reached the, th the, the committee threshold sooner mm -hmm. than mine did. But we still reached the threshold. And then, so you'd see the certification votes that would be different or in a different order. But um, just so it's a part of kind of running my own node, participating um, and wanting to answer all those questions, I dug deeper and deeper into it um, and just loved it, right? And then as the more I, I did that, the more other um, chains that I would either install or already were using started to kind of look not so nice. Um, and then yeah, I continue to do that. I can still add an avalanche node running for a while. And this was much later. And then, you know, the, the, the differences are quite stark. Um, and it was not kind to avalanche in terms of like Algorand just crushes it efficiency wise. I see. But, I, see. I, I yeah, wonder if any of those stuff. tools that you use to learn more about the consensus are uh, something that uh, you eventually sort of uh, propagated with... Uh, with folks over Discord, or uh, because oh, I know oh, yeah. since the, the, 2019, there's, there's been quite a few tools uh, for for monitoring the uh, the participation nodes, I believe. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I can imagine the 2019 scene look uh, drastically different. Yeah, so I didn't, I wasn't really into it like aggressively um, until uh, I think my first algo purchase was March of 2020. 
So I, I want to say like me getting like really into it was probably, you know, February of 2020. Mm -hmm. And then Same. from there, um, and then I forget, I run a, a telegram uh, channel as well. I forget when that one got started, but, uh, but yeah, so I've been in, in it like aggressively since early 2020. Awesome. That, that, that's a very interesting insight. And, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's awesome to see that, you know, Silvio's uh, talks and lectures and podcasts is, is, is an entry point for many people to the ecosystem it, because yeah, it is. And I, I try to convey that. I think at times it's like, you know, it, it, it's hard to, you know, you, 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 people need to be themselves and it's like, you can tell it's like, you, you don't want ink or anybody like kind of like forcing yeah. Silvio to doing all these things that just isn't really like, you know, he wants to, to research, you know, and, you know, and just let him be what he excels at. That said, you know, the times he does talk a lot of times, um, he's fantastic. Um, he's very, he's very personable, very engaging. Um, and, you know, typically explains things, you know, very well yeah. for some I mean, things. His, his very, ability very to topics. make, you know, very complex and exotic crypto cryptography explained in very simple terms or very simple references yeah. to, you know, economy or, or, or just general governance models is, is, is amazing. Like, uh, that's, that's, I guess, uh, certainly something that, um, uh, a good academician should, 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 should strive for in, uh, especially in the, the domain of computer science. But, uh, yeah. so yeah, I, I kind of like, will kind of like hint to the algorithm people. Sometimes I haven't done it lately. It's just like, Hey, like, can you get him to like talk at least once a month or you know, something, <laughs> but like, there's, there's no question that the Lex Friedman uh, talk actually did bring a lot of people to algorithm. Um, I think the bear market's probably shaken a lot of people out at this point. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean those those you know getting him, those talks are always fantastic for the for the for the uh, the chain. And I, uh, on the same topic, this is a bit off topic. Just wanted to highlight as well that uh, uh, there's this uh, professor from Columbia University. Uh, his name is Tim Rothgard, and he recently started a very nice lecture on the consensus mechanisms uh, in, in blockchain systems and. Uh, there's some really interesting work uh, around um, basically theories that are trying to prove whether um, Byzantine agreement or like BFT, like protocols, uh, especially like Algorand, whether this is actually um, about as good as you can get in regards to, you know, building something that optimizes for consistency in partial, uh, in partially synchronous network model. And mm -hmm. it, it, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, there, there would be some interesting research in the coming years that might prove that, uh, you know, um, if, if you optimize for security and consistency, then you probably wouldn't want your network to be forked and you probably want to rely on uh, public key encryption, uh, basically. So. Yeah, 100%. I mean, like, I think that the, the, the kind of nuances of Algorand's, you know, no forking extends to quite a bit, actually. It's not just the per block it is even just the chain itself yeah. um but um yeah i, I mean that, that i think that's just one of the, that's just the beauties of of its you know it's uh what is it studio calls it the the ba star <laughs> yeah yeah the business um, agreement star star <laughs> um but just the fact that you know you can basically have a near star <laughs> near mm -hmm. asterisk unlimited kind of um uh node set but have a um effectively fixed committee size out of massive massive number of participants means you have you know kind of a controlled um um uh, costs mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know for the agreement um yet you're still talking to random participants out of a massive pool and three different random um, committees per block. Um, so it's fantastic. So the, the, you know, the other chain that talk about, Oh, well, you know, Oh, you're, you're, of course you're doing that. Cause it's, you're, you're only talking to a limit, a small committee. Well, yes, it's a small committee different three times per block, potentially out of millions of nodes. Right. That's fantastic. Uh, I think that's kind of ideal. Yeah. And the ones that like, oh, we'll we'll somehow magically talk to those millions of nodes and come to agreement very quickly. It's like you see that they 
the ones that kind of promise that um, they have kind of fallen on their face and haven't, haven't had to kind of like kind of push aside some of their original discussions about how it worked and, and rework it a little bit. Yeah. Um, and, and then, I mean, the fact that everything is offline basically up until the point and when, when the decision is made on whether you're proposing or whether you're part of the committee, which is also, I think, was a very interesting. Right. It's not. There's no polling, right? Like it's 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 the participants aren't each asking each other. Well, what do you think? What do you think? I mean, it's it's basically it's a push. It's a push model. It's a push model. It's a it's a randomized push with the receivers able to detect mm -hmm. um, whether or not the participant is is is, is correct. So um, it's this is fantastic. Um, you know, there's, I said, I said there, there's, there's issues with it that need resolved. Um, but, um, they'll, they'll have time, but yeah, I love it. And, um, yeah, so, sorry, we're sort of, uh, branching off yeah, with the, with, with like, the my, but, team, uh, my team, if they're watching this is probably just laughing, laughing their heads off because we'll <laughs> like our team meetings, we'll go off on these side tangents for hours. Uh, I'm really bad about it. I apologize. No worries on that. I think this is these kind of tangents are actually perfect for a podcast setting, you know. Yeah. But um, to continue on, I think we certainly covered uh, your biography, your sort of introduction to, <laughs> yeah. to 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 Algorand and the consensus mechanism. But uh, what, what's the if you can cover in short, like what's the story behind the transaction lab and uh, yeah, uh, picking uh, the very first uh, offering. Um, yeah, I mean, I was basically, um, you know, kind of, um, software engineer for a large cloud company, you know, by day, um, and at night, you know, Algorand was kind of my, uh, you know, hobby, side hobby plaything, to a certain extent. And, um, you know, at, at one point I was, you know, helping people quite often, you know, teaching them about Algorand, um, and, um, I ended up, um, doing some part-time work for a project to help out with their, their infra, um, and met, um, my, uh, co-founders through that. And then just through a series of interesting events, um, we all, uh, uh, left that and decided to forge our own bath. And so I was doing kind of um, you know, doing that at night, you know, here and there. Uh, and then it's like, you know what, I want to do this full time. So, um, decided to start a new company with those guys and, um, put in my notice, the company and started the transaction lab. And then it was just like, okay, well, what are we going to do? Um, and, I think the original plans for us is to do, you know, yeah, another types of financial thing, like almost everything is in, in, in the, in the DeFi, it's all about, you know, AMMs and you know, indexes and things like that. And I think even at that time, we're like, you know, it, it's already kind of feeling like it's going to be a crowded market. Um, and I think, you know, they're all just variants of each other. We should, you know, do something uh, different. And um, Algorand, you know, did not have a naming service at the time. And it seemed kind of perfect for it. Um, because, you know, I, I, I had an unstoppable domain at that time. Um, I don't recall ever creating an ENS uh, domain. But, you know, I, I very quickly decided that in software domain was kind of unusable um, because, you know, just to, to pay, you know, five to $20 just to update a field and it take, you know, 10, 12 minutes. I was like, this is just ridiculous. And they, they run on the um, grid? Uh, no, they're on Ethereum. Hmm. And then they, they moved um, recently to, to, to Polygon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but that was because, you know, I think the, on Ethereum is just is kind of unusable um, to cost so much to do anything with it, um, and you know Polygon has lots of issues too. I heard people like talking, you know, like a week just to move your, your coin. 
um, between chains. It's ridiculous. It's 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 a they, they call they they build themselves as a as a, as a layer two for Ethereum, but it's it's just a completely different chain. It's just kind of kind of ridiculous, I think. But you know, Algorand, um, and it's come a long way since. Actually, it's had to kind of adapt as Algorand has improved the ABM, but. Um, the with transactions being just a thousand micro algo, you know, point zero zero one algo, um, for you know a decent amount of operational, you know, compute that you can get for that is fantastic. You know, so you know, like with our current current the current the current solution, um, the current uh, tech that's being used for NFTs, you know, you can update say four fields uh, per transaction. Um, and it's 0 0.001 algo, which right now is what 300 of a cent and 3.6 seconds guaranteed finality. So, you know, and, and the fact that it's stored as global state also means that any contract can access it um, without even making a contract call. It's just a direct state reference. And then anything on the internet can reference it with just a single HTTP call. So to any algorithm node, you could retrieve the state of an NFT with one call. Right, so it's just all across the board between you know Algorand's REST APIs, the way you access state of a, a, a contract, um, and the um, transaction speed and cost. It's it's just, it's really nice for a naming service, but it's it's a lot more than just a naming service. But we can talk about that later, I guess. I see. Yeah, and uh, I know that. Uh... NFD also provides a uh, a public uh, read only API, right? So there is also a, yeah, it, a very it's, nice... it's both. It's 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 read write, but it's write in the sense that it's still all on the chain. Mm -hmm. But um, so I, yeah, yeah. We, we 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 you 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 call the API, and then if you want to like modify your NFD to the API, then all it will do is construct the transactions for you to sign to submit to a node to modify the NFT and mm -hmm. modify the NFT state via the contracts. But there's no like you call an API and then we're like updating some database or whatever, it, it's all on chain. You know, so the, the entire API is, is, is a matter of either giving you cache data that's fed from the chain or providing you transactions to sign to update the chain. And then the, 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 the fact that the chain was updated is how that, that update is seen by anyone else. Mm -hmm. So I guess uh, this was a very nice warm up for the the main uh, you know discussion around the NF NFD itself. So essentially, ju just for the listeners out there to set the uh, stage, essentially uh, when we well when we talk about name services, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the, of, of course there's are systems that uh, help us, you know convert um an easy an easy readable name to a uh, some some physical address on the network for example and so yeah. uh, essentially we could say that well the most used name service in the world is something that powers the internet the uh, dns so it allows us to use human you know friendly names for mapping i can't imagine uh, anyone ever typing google's ip addresses every time you want to go to google or things like that so it's certainly something that is a, a foundational feature that uh, enables the capabilities of the uh, of internet which uh, i guess we could say layer zero in this case um but then when we speak about the notion of name services within Web3, um, the mm -hmm. definition, of course, deviates. So if, if you could just set the stage for, um, you know, the main difference uh, when we speak uh, of the name services within the Web3 yeah. space. And yeah, I think. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, th th there's there's a lot of, of I kind of, I don't know, misconceptions. There's a lot of, of misinformation from a lot of people as well about a lot of what these things are at least today um you know there's all these different services on completely different chains um and you know basically you know there some of these services try to pattern themselves after dns in terms of uh, like permission layers you know, so like, um, if you know, in, in DNS, if you uh, own the the 
apple.com zone that, you know, the com, uh, DLD is to delegate the, the Apple zone to, uh, Apple you know, servers. And then if they have, you know, kind of subdomains of that, that are either zone delegations or resource records off of that zone, the key is, is that apple.com in a sense can, has complete total control of all those subdomains. Um, and so it, it, you see some naming services in like NS, like NS has the notion of subdomains, but the the parent, in a sense, at any point in time, can basically completely rug the children. And it's also a rental model. So it's like if you have a subdomain in ENS, your parent can expire, get taken over by someone else who rents it, and then basically render your subdomain inoperable and you have no control over it. So it's like, it, it's like you have these things, they, they say there's kind of web three about, you know, you owning your data, but here's a case where you don't own your data, right? And so it's, 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 it's interesting that there's different naming services with different models um, that where they're trying to basically like, oh, let's take DNS and, and, and put it on the blockchain. Um, and I think a lot of people talk about web three, it's just more about, you know, the user owning, you know, you owning your data. It's not Facebook owning your data or Google owning your data or whatever. It's you own your data and then you basically define what that data is and what you do or don't store there. And you could even have different identities, right? And so at least for, for NFDs, that's um, the philosophy that you have um, user-controlled, and owned data that that there is a discovery mechanism for the name. But then even with uh, segments, we're calling them segments, not subdomains, that it's still always wholly owned by that, that account holder, that owner. And whatever data you put there, whatever you choose to put there, you control, and it's all probably visible. It doesn't necessarily mean the data you put there might not be a link to something that is privacy preserving. So you could still potentially have like say attestations with other services that provided like KYC or something like that, that could be proven uh, independently, but in a secure way that you could link to your NFT, for example. But there's also times where you might want to have public information exposed in your NFT. Um, and there's times where that's really useful, you know, like for like NFT for project creators and things. Um, cause you might want to say, yes, uh, this is my NFT wallet. I'm out to algo, you know, or this is, uh, this is my NFT. These are my creations because I'm this artist and here's all this public information so that, you know, I'm actually the, the, the real creator of these things. Um, so I think providing that on chain discoverability and user controlled uh, ownership is the key. And then you can put all kinds of things into it that open it up to the entire chain and even outside the chain because the chain is accessible just via the internet by anything or anyone, right? Um, I think that's where it gets interesting. So it's a lot more than just a name to an address or address to a name. Like that gives you the discovery, discoverability both directions. So the name could be like, I want to send, I want to find information about this name or send something to this name. The address is more like there's activity on chain. And I, and I can use the activity on chain to tie that back to some type of identity. And then what is defined with that identity is still controlled by that identity. And that could be pseudonymous. It could, it could be like, I could create an NFT that has just a name and I put no public information in it at all on purpose but still have a lot of great use and utility for that. Like maybe it references one of my Twitter alts, right? That I'm still not, that's that's not doxed, but there could still be lots of use and utility there. And so I, I think that's really interesting that, you know, there's some models where the, the assumption is that you must have this fixed guaranteed identity tied back to like KYC information. And I think the user should always be in complete control of that. And I should be able to have a like an NFD that's public if I want to make it public and very, very visible with full KYC. There's ways of validating that, either securely or not. 
depending because you might want it to be public. You might want it to be a secure attestation that you can that someone could say, um, is this person KYC? I can check this. Yes, they're KYC, but I don't really know their information. So like you'll be able to do that. But uh, I might also want to have an NFD where um, I have no identifying information, but I'm still able to participate in the ecosystem for forward and reverse lookups. Right? So like maybe maybe I'm secretly a massive NFT whale, right? And you might see my purchases of, you know, uh, uh, glass half full dot algo, right? Whatever. And, but the thing is, is, is that can, in some ways can kind of be its own kind of, I don't know, kind of social game in the sense you can see glass half full dot algo has bought all these entities and like, who is this person, right? But there might be no information in that other than the name. Um, but it can still be really useful. Like if I wanted to send algo to my glass half full dot algo, I could send it or, or I could see, you know, that, Hey, uh, I'm on the leaderboards, but no one would know who it was, but it's still, it's still cool to be able to bring and surface that sort of, um, user controlled identity, mm -hmm. uh, as public or not as someone wants and still have it just all magically work. I love it. Like I said, I'll I'll go on really weird tangents. I'm sorry. No, no, this is this is this is great. Uh, like if uh, if time, you know, if there's any time constraints uh, on your site, and uh, j just let me know. But so far, I think uh, we are uh, pretty well uh, in regards to sort of the you know de defining the introduction for uh, for for the NFD and uh, I suppose since this was also one of the first. Um, name services in the Algorand ecosystem, mm -hmm. um, a, a good scenario that it's certainly covered out of the box, as you mentioned, I uh, just wanted to highlight it as, as well, is, is a common case when uh, in in the blockchain ecosystem, you have uh, multiple participants, they would like to exchange certain assets, they would like to exchange certain tokens and etc. And usually the critique for uh, ecosystems that don't contain any name services is the fact that well there's uh, just a very long string which is your public key or public address you've got to memorize it somehow or uh, it's just something that is uh, well certainly not convenient to share every no, time yeah. and like i can't imagine characters is a lot yeah, to is... uh there's a lot to type in it's even and, a lot of space <laughs> yeah and so uh, i suppose one of the main um cases for that was also the fact that um nfd domains also um cooperates a lot with different uh well wallet services and uh, other defi systems in the algorand ecosystems uh, in order to provide uh, them access to um, essentially do the lookups for um attached nfd aliases so in other words you know a user could essentially um, eliminate this issue and the need to memorize uh, this large public keys, right? You can uh, go on NFD domains, you can get uh, something from from the marketplace, or you can mint uh, entirely new one if the, there's no mm -hmm. such uh, NFD domain yet, and uh, attach your wallet to it. And as Patrick just outlined, essentially, uh, it's it's really up to you whether you want to make that alias. Um, to to be mapped to a specific wallet or you know you, you don't have to do that if you don't want to but if you want to have a utility and to use it for payments or etc um, th this is also one of the cases that um, nfd domains are very helpful for um, but um, i guess to to go on a little bit in regards to um, I, th I think you also provided a, a set of key features as well uh, already. <laughs> yeah, so... there's, there's some I should probably cover in more depth, but yeah, I kind of went all over the place. <laughs> but uh, I, I guess what would also be really um, interesting to hear about, uh, and especially for folks uh, listening to this, uh, is some of the more technical aspects in regards to the architecture. And of course, you know, uh, we don't need to cover every single component in the system, but uh, would be really nice to you know cover the components that uh, rely directly on some of the L1 capabilities of Algorand. So, for example, how smart contracts are used in this particular case, uh, right? With every mint, uh, I, I believe there is a dedicated uh, instance uh, for a, a bundle of stateful and stateless contracts being deployed. 
Um, and basically, yeah, like uh, architecture specific to components that rely directly on the Algorand ecosystem. And this will lead us to also uh, a follow-up question on, you know, uh, which which I think is at this point already very well covered by yourself. Uh, but, you know, a question on um, well, why was Algorand chosen as a, as a chain to power the platform. Um, but yeah, if, if you could uh, just briefly cover on that and... Uh... Yeah, um, so loosely, and some of this stuff will kind of change over time um, as, um, you know, I think with box storage coming soon, um, then it will probably transition some aspects of the design to use boxes um, where, where appropriate. Um, but right now, there's kind of the discovery mechanism, the on chain discovery mechanism for uh, forward lookups, you know, a name to address and for reverse lookups address to um, one or more names. Um, and that is via logic signature accounts. So there's basically specially constructed um, teal bytecode where the name and or address is kind of composed into that. And the resulting uh, hash of that teal is, you know, what makes up a logic sig account now grant. So that that hashed um, code gives you a unique Algorand account um, address. And that account is opted into a, uh, an NFT registry contract. And the local state of that logic account contains um, a reference to the application ID of the NFT. So for a given name, there's a logic sig. So I, so I look up patrick.algo composed into this bytecode. So you can say like there's even, I've got you know, all the codes there, do this all on chain, take this bytecode, replace these eight bytes, add these bytes at the end, hash it, look up the, the um, local state of the registry contract, get the application ID. The application ID is the NFD uh, ID for that NFD. Mm -hmm. And so each um, NFD, like Patrick and Algo, is a distinct new contract instance. Like normally a lot of, like, uh, a lot of the, the DeFi sort of things work where there's a contract and there's like local state. This is a case where every NFD is a completely new contract instance. And the benefit of that is the state, like that, once you have the application ID of like say pattern to algo, that'll never change. That's pattern to algo is that ID. So you can just read its global state and that's all of the state of pattern to algo. Um, and so the benefit of, of having distinct application, it's for one is, um, prior to boxes is the only way to get a decent amount of storage. Mm -hmm. So um, by having a distinct um, application per NFD uh, and by asking for the maximum number of keys, which you have to ask for upfront, um, then you get uh, eight, uh, eight kilobytes of, mm -hmm. of, of storage max. So 64 keys, 128 bytes each key is the the global state yeah. for a, a contract. And then the another benefit of it being its own contract is starting with AVM 1.0, I think TL5, then each um, contract also has an associated account. So it has there's a contract account. That will that is what we call the NFD's vault. Mm -hmm. And so that will be exposed in, in the future where each NFD is also its own uh, bank in a sense. So you'll be able to deposit mm -hmm. assets into your NFD. Um, and technically you'd be able to sell the NFD with all its assets. Mm, I see. So mm -hmm. you'd be able to load up your NFD and put you know, thousands of NFTs or even coin um, into its vault and you wouldn't have to opt in. Like it, it would also get away. It would also um, uh, remove the opt-in re requirements. So you'd be able to kind of airdrop to into your vault um, without having to do any opt-in procedures. Like it would auto opt-in to you to you sending to it. 
Um, and there'd be restrictions about like, you know, you could have your vault locked or unlocked. If it's a, if it's a locked vault, only you can send to it. If it's unlocked, you could allow certain participants to kind of airdrop you. They would have to cover the minimum balance requirements when they up it in. So it's like someone couldn't yeah. like, you know, spam you and like inc- make it so that your minimum balance requirement was really high. Like mm-hmm. They would have to pay for that. Um, then you'd be able to trans, you'd be able to sell that NFT, that NFT with all of its assets. Um, and then there's other kind of cool things about that uh, vault account. Um, the NFT also mints its own NFT. Um, so the NFT creates an ARC-19 NFT um, where the creator is that, that vault. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you go to the gallery view of your NFT and say creations, if you've never created an NFT in your life, it will show there's a creation. And the creation will be the, NF- NF- the NFT's NFT mm-hmm. because... Uh, the gallery shows all related accounts to your NFT. All the related accounts are the owner, the NFT is a vault, and then any linked accounts that you have. So it'll automatically show its own creation as one of the creations for the NFT. And then that NFT it creates as you update your NFT, like if you change your your avatar or you change metadata, like you put your name or your email address, Twitter, mm-hmm. bio, whatever, then um, the meta, that metadata, the same as you'd get if you hit our API, is pinned to IPFS and the NFT is updated with that metadata. And so then the NFT is an ARC-19 NFT so that you would then see your NFD as a, a collectible in like your para wallet or any other wallet. And I see. So it's that, it's Im- Im- embedded because you said it's uh, Arc nineteen, right? So the, the 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 metadata is then just parsed directly from that NFT in in, in most uh, you know. Uh, yeah, the, the met, yeah the metadata explorers. is all on IPFS, mm-hmm. and then the image link within that metadata then it is the image link of the IPFS yeah. uh, avatar or you know that you set. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, the the reason for that NFT, and then that NFT is completely owned and controlled by the NFT, so it's actually frozen into the buyer's account. And the act of you selling your NFT, the NFT moves with it into the new buyer's account. Um, so the, the intent of that is um, with contract state, it's not it's not visible, right? If if you know if I'm if I have some some uh, reference in global state of some contract somewhere that happens to reference my account, you you, you don't see that. Like I, I wanted um, someone to be able to go into like um, an NFT marketplace or their wallet and see I own this thing, right? If I'm gonna I'm gonna buy this identity, I want to see that I actually own it outside of just this website. Mm-hmm. Right. And so by having that NFT that is also dynamic, then I can see that I own this thing. And it, it becomes it becomes more tangible um, to have that. It, it took a lot, a lot of extra work to have that. But I think there's something to be said about, you know, being able to go into your, your wallet and see that you actually own this thing. And That's if it was cool. just contract state, you wouldn't see that. And then there's even side benefits where like, you know, Algo Explorer, they'll be they'll be adding additional NFT support soon. Like you can already um, like look up an NFT by its name and go to its address and things like that in Algo Explorer. They'll be doing reverse address. So like the whole transactions as you walk the blocks, you'll see the NFT names for all transactions soon. Oh wow. Okay. But um, one kind of fun benefit before they added NFT support formally, they indirectly already support NFTs without doing it, without aware being aware. Because the NFT um, uh, asset name is the NFT. Mm-hmm. So if you typed Patrick.algo, you would go to its NFT. And you could see and every, NFT, every transaction associated with it. In, in yeah, and then you'd see the other transactions. Yeah. You'd see, oh, where that got created. Oh, it got created by this account. You'd follow that. So you'd be able to kind of work your way back uh, up the spider web via that NFT. And you'd be able to see when that NFT is moves from account to account, you'll even be able to see ownership transfers. Um, so it just, it just kind of checked a lot of boxes and is, is, is ended up being really useful. And then also 
this is kind of more, you know, lower level algorithm sort of stuff. One really useful thing about that NFT also is that in Teal, it's very easy and very cheap to check um, an asset balance, right? So if I want to say, does this sender, like say someone's calling my contract, mm -hmm. I, I could say, well, does that sender have asset X, right? And you can use that as like a permissions model for one. So it could be like, does this sender have this one permissions key, which is an ASA? And if, if so, oh, then I'll give them the permission or I'll let them make this contract call. Well, you can use the NFD's NFT as a permission key, right? So instead of like having to like do all these weird, uh, you know, arm chain um, resolving, um, which you can do, like you could reconstruct the logic SIG in Teal and look it up and look to the logic to the local state. But because of foreign arrays, you'd have to already know the answer to that question and pass those as foreign references. But um, what you can do is if you already know the asset ID of the NFD and verified that, you could pass the asset ID um, or have that coded in of an NFD and use that as permissions. So you could basically say like, I wanna have an allow list of NFDs that can send to me. So you could construct that allow see, list by just having a list of asset IDs. Because then you can check to see, does the sender hold this asset? If they are, they're the owner of that NFD. So you could use the asset ID as a permissions token for allow listing NFDs without having to do any kind of on-chain lookups and, and still guarantee because that 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 NF that asset can only be it's it's, it's frozen, it's it's default frozen um, with clawback. The clawback is to the NFD itself. Mm -hmm. So the only place that token can be is either in the owner's account or inside the NFD's own vault. So um, you could basically know either the NFD itself is calling you, literally, or the owner of that NFD is calling you if they held that asset. And that's, so, that, that, like, it's all these little things approach. that end up a ripple effect of of benefits. Um, but to have all those pieces is is a lot of work. Um, but um, yeah, I think between the NFT, the NFD, the account, the fact that you have the global state, and the, and then the lookups. That's that's most of the architecture. Um, the the um, the fact that we had to buy up so much storage up front does make the NFDs very expensive as far as the minimum balance requirement. So it, it's almost like five algo hard carry cost just to exist. It's uh, so like when you buy the NFD, you'll see like that there's like a couple of transactions in the transaction. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty large transaction group. Yeah. So it's like. It's like eight transactions plus five inner transactions for the mint, it's like 13 mm -hmm. transactions or something. And one of the transactions is an independent transaction that's a five algo payout. And what you're really doing is you're paying to like this admin account that then pays the MBR requirements of the logic SIG and the NFD. And the logic SIG is one algo for each. Because it, it, I bought up all 16 local state keys for those. And then for the NFD, it's all 64 byte uh, keys. So it ends up being just under five algo uh, raw carry cost. And then boxes, if I transition and do a hybrid approach of state plus boxes, then maybe I can knock off maybe three algo. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. Well, it's, uh, it's, uh, I'm very curious to, to see how, how you guys are going to also, uh, you know, uh, uh, apply box storage once it's available. I, I actually thought that's something that they announced along with the state proofs recently, and this is, this is already... So box storage is not out yet. It's in, mm. you, it, it's in a branch. You can download it and develop it against it um, locally, but it's not been pushed out oh, I see, to I be in that yet. Um, I, I think they definitely want to, to, to pound their chest about it at Decipher. So, yeah. I mean, I, I think one way or another, they'll be talking about boxes at Decipher a lot. And I would think bare minimum, it's probably at least in Bayonet. Um, but um, 
yeah, it, there, there's a lot of um, kind of ripple effects, and there's 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 pros and cons to to, to boxes versus global state. The nice thing about boxes is that it's pay as you go, which I think is a is a, a much is a much better model for mm-hmm. these because then it's it's like you if you want to store lots and lots of data, then, you, then the user yeah, pays for pay it as they them, want to yeah. store it, right? Whereas right now we have to to basically get that a bunch of that cost up front, and if you don't really use it. And because you have, you can't ever like for when you ask for global state keys, you have to ask for the most you'll ever ever use, like upfront, and, and you can never change it. Um, but um, I think one nice thing also about that's kind of cool about the NFTs also being distinct contract instances, it it lets it kind of still gives the user complete control, which I like that idea. It, it, it just the non vulnerable it is it 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 checks a lot of boxes in the sense that because it's a distinct contract, the contracts are upgradable because we are and have added features and we'll be adding some significant features very soon, actually. But to do that, the NFT contract gets upgraded. However, if the users are really like, I don't like this, right? You can go into your NFD, go to edit. There's contract, smart like contract version. It will show you the current version of the contract. And then there's a radio button there. You can lock your contract. So on a per NFD basis, the owner can lock it. Interesting. And Great. it's not upgradable. And the thing that was kind of cool, it's not like this is like the contract for everything. It's just that NFD. So, 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 you know, so, so does it mean that every upgrade um to the contracts essentially would still require um an approval from the from the owner essentially if they locked it if, if they locked it okay i see i right. see so it, it really comes more like you know because like i've known for some time like there's things i mean like, even as i developed it there was new features that came out for like i like the support for inner transactions so before we went live i'm like okay this fix like right now i it was like a three stage claim process because mm-hmm. it had a mint i had you to you to mint the contract and you couldn't know what because in order to fund the vault you had to know what the vault account was well you couldn't know what the vault account was until the application itself was actually created mm-hmm. so you had to cur- create the nfd uh, submit that transaction then okay, what application ID is it? Okay, well now I can submit and do this. Well, as a part of T- a TL five, I think maybe TL six. Then you had inner transactions and the ability to create um, an application in one in one transaction as a part of a group, and then later in that same group reference what the created application ID was, fund that application via another contract. So another, they call this trampolining. So a second contract then has to send funds mm-hmm. to the account that was just created in a transaction. Then it can make inner transaction calls to that contract. And so, you know, before we went mainnet, before we went to live, I, I like had to redo the whole minting process to support inner transactions and make it so it was just a big transaction group to mint and then another one to claim, which is really just like taking ownership of the NFT and stuff. Um, well, I knew that like things like box storage would come in as well. And I knew there's features that we're going to release like the vault support and segment support that are upgrades. So in, in a sense, it's, it's like I, I want this to be a, uh, a service that provides utility that gets better over time. Right. And like it's not this static thing where it's like I created these contracts and I'm done with it and then they just stagnate and die. I, I want this to be a a a growing useful utility. Um but still provide the user the control where they can say, yeah. you know, look, I mm-hmm. looked at your contracts, I'm okay with it, but I don't want you to ever change it again, lock it. Now it's quite possible that certain functionality in the future won't work for them, but that's still their choice. Right. And, and I like I like the the the, the flexibility there yeah. where it's like where we can continue to provide new features and new functionality um, that improves the the, pro, the 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 platform and utility, which boosts the value for everyone, um, but also gives the ability for people to have that individual control and say, nope, I want to lock it. 
and then if it's locked, yeah. there's nothing we can do. It's. I think it's a very like balanced sweet spot in between. You know, just mutable or immutable contracts. It's uh, ha having mm -hmm. this, this this ability to upgrade, but at the same time giving the control whether you want to lock it and then you know stay stay there forever in a specific version. And then, and then even if they lock it, so like like right now there's some debate. Like the users are asking, like, oh, when you add segments, but you just push that out. And I'm mm -hmm. like, uh, I I could, but like one part of me is kind of uncomfortable with that. I kind of want users to have to go to there and explicitly upgrade their contract. But, you know, it's just, I think what we'll probably do is that'll probably still be what they have to do, but we'll have to make sure our interface looks to see what version of the, of the contract their NFT is on and tailors the interface to that mm, a see. little bit. Because it'll be like when we add segments, which will be like subdomains in a sense, but not. So like a segment, um, so if I own bennett.algo for example as a root um then by default that is that root will be is locked um and then if i wanted to then i as the owner can mint a segment off of that but only i can so i could then mint patrick.bennett.algo off of bennett.algo and it's it's something to change but right now the thinking is it would be five algo to cover that carry cost plus three dollars so it would be three dollars plus five algo for me to mint patrick.bennett.algo. Now, once patrick.bennett.algo exists, it is completely standalone, completely self-sovereign. It has like bennett.algo has a zero control over it. Mm -hmm. And so that could then be resold or repurposed, however. So like if there was an organization that wanted to control their route, then they would never unlock it. They would leave it locked, and then it comes down to just key control, which you know, which is a lot all crypto usually is, is key control, and that could be multi-sig. There's lots of things, ways of doing that. They could do rekeying tricks, but they could then control those, and they could even. What's kind of cool is because ownership and linkage is independent, so you could have custodial accounts for your organization, um, mint those keep your, your your NFD locked, control and own all those NFDs, but have independent accounts for your your users for keys with keys that they control that get that they link into the NFD. So you only one time have the two party transaction sign. And then now that NFD could still be owned by the organization or application or service, yet be associated with activity of the user's controlled account. I see. Um, so that would be a lock scenario. You could mm -hmm. also say I own Ben.algo. I could unlock Ben.algo. And if I unlock it, then I set a price, a market price. I can say anyone can mint off Ben.algo for X dollars. And then anyone could go and say, oh, I want to create John dot Bennett, you know, or Pat, you know, Patrick dot Bennett dot algo. And I go, okay, well, they said the price is five dollars. So five algo plus five dollars buy. And then now they own it and they have complete total ownership and control of it. Again, the parent has no rights. The only rights you have on segmentation is is the minting. I see. That's it. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's either locked and and only you can mint, or it's unlocked and anyone can mint. But then once created, then it's completely self-sovereign, completely standalone and controlled by the keys and can be transferred. How, you know, it depends how you want to do it. But the fact that ownership and linkage is, is, is ownership, ownership can be independent from what accounts are linked also opens up lots of possibilities. So now you could have a custodial solution where you own the NFTs, but the visibility on chain is another account. So activity for that user controlled account could be could show up as that 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 segment. But the owner is a different account. So I mean you, I you following? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I see. I, I, I mean I feel like you're also the uh, sort of touching some of the uh features for the future roadmap that uh, yeah. uh so se segments segments are are in beta like mm -hmm. right now. Like mm -hmm. basically um we have a, a significant partner who's will be probably starting testing of that i think next week awesome. um so you'll if people look around and be in that and test that you'll probably start seeing 
uh, you'll see if you go to testnet, you'll see some segments there now. Um, it's just that the 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 UI is not um, the UI is just getting started being mm-hmm. started. Um, so the contracts are there, the, the USD pricing is there. I might switch to a different Oracle for the pricing. Mm-hmm. Um, right now, it's just a, an Oracle I just threw together myself. Um, but it's mostly it's about getting you know price data on chain for the contract to reference, and so I could really reference any Oracle, and it really wouldn't care. Um, so segments are next. Um, and then vaults will presumably be after that. And vaults are much like the contract wise is actually very, very simple. Um, it's more involved on the UI because with vaults, it's really almost more like our interface has to have a mini wallet interface, you know, because now you're going to have to see assets in your, in your vault account and be able to like do sends from your vault. So it's like, we almost kind of need you know, a full wallet interface. Nice. And, you know, ideally we talk to the wallet providers and say, hey, support vault. <laughs> um, but I just know that, that, that you know, hopefully it'll happen, but that takes time. So bare minimum, we have to support it first. Um, and then, so that's just a much larger UI uplift. But uh, yeah, segments first, vaults next, and then there's other cool stuff that, that may happen in between. But um, yeah, I mean, so if users have the contracts locked, then they'll have to unlock their contract and then there'll be a, a choice um, to, to upgrade. So they can just, they can force the upgrade themselves. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's cool. So I, I think there's a good chance what will happen is, is we might not necessarily force the upgrade and what will happen is if, if they if they want to try to mint off their name, uh, it'll just say, hey, you, you can't, you have to upgrade your contract first before you can create a segment. Um, and then, because I, I don't think, you know, if someone wants to unlock their segment and have people mint off it, then it'll be very obvious they'll they'll want to do that upgrade. And then if people want to mint set off their own segment, it'll be the same thing. Then they'll they'll be told they need to upgrade and they'll upgrade that time. But it's probably no reason to like literally touch every single NFT and upgrade it on the on the chance they might want a segment. Mm-hmm. So I I'll probably err on the side of them upgrading. Um it just feels better because I, I don't like I, I don't don't think I'd want to push out updates unless there was like a like a vulnerability or something or unless there was um something where like everything would break unless they're on mm-hmm. that version mm-hmm. because it's like a significant change like honestly like I think the transition to boxes will be interesting because I'll have to have like a transition process like if the if this if the data moves from state the boxes it's a very very different um but there are like i said there there are there are cons as i was saying like this is a tangible audience i think um the fact that if you put the the metadata of like user-defined fields like right now on a contract i could reference an nfd and say what's their twitter twitter handle right and just read it directly from state Mm -hmm. right and make use of that that's really handy and nice with boxes the only way you'd be able to get that data is to make a contract call because boxes will be completely opaque to outside contracts. Only the contract that owns the box can read it and see it. So the only way you'll be able to get that data is you have to make, you literally have to make an inter, like a, a contract to contract call. The contract would, would do and make an inner transaction to the NFD's app ID and say, hey, give me the value of this property. So it will basically kind of give, introduce an extra hop in this case for yeah, an extra, the, yeah. extra hop. And the fact that because right now with the foreign references, until they add their their uh, um, simulation API, which they're talking about, um, you would have to know transitively everything that's going to be referenced by every call. So if you called contract A and then contract A wanted to read um, a property in a box of contract B. You would have had you'd have you'll have to pass that box reference in a call to contract A. Mm, I see. Like in the outer transaction, you have to know everything that's gonna be touched transitively across all calls, all assets, all applications, all accounts, all boxes. And you can't ax and you can't touch more than eight of those combined. Hmm, I see. So it's all about limiting, like in a sense, the amount of compute and IO per transaction. So it, it all makes sense. And it's part of why it's able to stay 
so efficient. But you know, it 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 just it just it, it definitely makes composability more interesting. Whereas if it's global state, they can just read the state directly. So that's it's it's kind of it's like it's not that clear cut. Maybe maybe it could be something like you know, uh, kind of like uh, you know a, 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 a basic model versus like a you know, but but yeah, once again linking to the fact that it's probably going to be needed and useful for, only for the folks who actually want to you know bundle a bunch of extra information there that can yeah. just fit into the global state. So yeah, maybe it's uh, like the the, but, the the transition itself maybe is also could be you know invoked. Uh, or initiated by the user, right? If you really want, please go ahead. You can switch to this uh, new new mode that will essentially uh, give you more data, but you got to pay extra. And uh, well, it's yeah. uh, well, I talked. It'll, it'll be interesting because segments. I think you know they'll be pretty cheap, um, and you know at, at at significant scale, even three dollars is it gets expensive. But I mean, like for for normal individual things, it's it's quite cheap. Um, but um, there's one project to talk to that it could be pretty pretty cool. I think the the, the thought is, is is potentially using uh, NFT segments as you know they could be used as um, uh, they could be used as profiles mm. for services. They could use this as service specific profiles. So now you could actually have uh, preferences for that service stored. With an NFT specific to that service for that account for that user, right? And it's automatically portable, pre portable preferences in a sense across all your devices automatically, but all on chain. It's not like am I using am I using the you know Firefox sync service or the Chrome sync or this whatever to, to sync your cookies or this whatever. It's like there's none of that. Um, it's it's uh, it would just be potentially a link to IPFS that that, that service depends and then updates in your NFT or potentially just stores right in the NFT. If it's not like, if it's, if it's, if it's, if it's sensitive information, the service could store it in IPFS, link the IPFS content ID in the NFT, and then it could be encrypted um, with something shared between the user and the service. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, or if it's okay to be public, like it's like, oh, I, I want dark mode or something like that. Like, I don't think anyone's gonna care that you like dark mode. Right, so you could have just some JSON just put right in the metadata of of your NFT that says like these are my UI preferences, mm -hmm. and then just the act of you connecting with an account at all, it can I connect to this account, this account oh is linked to this NFT which is a segment of my service, I'll pull its preferences from that, and so just the act of you connecting your wallet, you automatically get all your preferences and settings specific to that service via the the service specific NFT. Yeah, it, it, that that's, and, that sounds like a very uh, suitable use case for this, actually. Yeah. yeah, and then you could even use that as a um, a model for um, subscriptions. If you had subscription based services, mm -hmm. now you okay. could use that as kind of like the you know getting past the bouncer at the door, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And then in a sense, the vault could also act as a um, a uh, mechanism for payout of um, usage tokens for the service or something. So I think there's there's some pretty cool stuff there. I see. A lot of, there's a lot of alpha in there for a lot of different things. Well, I, I think to like for the most of the folks who were already familiar with NFD, I think uh, you certainly did expand the horizon in regards to you know the the set of features that are yeah. available and set of features that are about to be planned. But uh, just uh, well, actually, one thing I, uh, and we're going really long. Sure. One thing I do want to touch on that I would like to see more use of, and it's not quite. I, I would have expected to be a lot more prevalent. It's not there quite yet is nft projects really like uh, tons of them all have nfts but a lot of them haven't put anything into them um like fill it out put an avatar that's one of their at your actual nfts preferably a verified because you know we do we will verify you actually own the nft like pick one out that they like keep it use that as their avatar set a banner verify like verify your twitter because people know your Twitter, your Twitter account, right? If this particular artist, this is your project, they know your Twitter um, 
verify that. Verify those, those socials and the NFT link all the creator accounts. Um, and then that way, the marketplaces that support NFT, which is a lot of them, and more are coming with very good NFT support. Um, like if you go to NFT Explorer, if that's linked, you're not going to see just an address, just a single address for the creator uh, of the NFT. You'll see the NFT. And where that's really important is because all these different marketplaces are kind of have their own, um, they're maintaining their own databases of collections and creators. And so it'll be like, oh, this wallet is, you know, Guana. This wallet is, you know, State Poofs. And they'll have like name, this is a verified thing, but they're maintaining all of that. Well, then, you know, the issue is, is, is if they don't, they're not, they can't always all keep track, <laughs> keep yeah. being consistent. Yeah, exactly. And so I should be able to go and see an NFT that gets listed on Marketplace and I go, oh, that's a, a Mingo or whatever. And well, it could be a fraud. And if you're just showing the creator address, you don't know, right? Unless that marketplace has already done the verification. Well, if instead I see, you know, go on the algo and I can, as the creator, I know that though that those creator wallets were linked to that NFT, I can go to the NFT and then see all the additional um, social trusts in a sense through verifications and then added to it. To, so I can get the additional assurances that, that that's the actual creator. And then once I know that and go, oh, well, if I see Guan to Algo as the creator of any of these NFTs, I know it's not a fraud, mm -hmm. not a forgery. You know, or a, you know, I, mean, I, 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 I can agree more with this case. And I'm actually guilty myself in regards to our uh, NFT, the, the main for the Algo world. Uh, we certainly need to uh, fill that. But uh, uh, yeah, like one particular case we would be also adding will uh, bundle all of our creator wallets, uh, add this to the metadata for the NFT domain and uh, add like a little verifier link to the Explorer page so that uh, people uh, holding the Algo Vault uh, NFTs can quickly uh, verify, you know, whether it's a legit one or not legit one. It's uh... And then and then like uh, projects that use Discord for verification. Yeah. Um, a fair number, um, if you, you can, because if someone verifies their Discord uh, ID on their NFT, then you can automatically know what NFTs um, someone using your Discord has and verify all their assets and give them roles based on the NFTs of yours they own without them having to sign any transactions, paste an address or anything. Because you can look up their Discord ID, their Snowflake ID. Mm -hmm. And so your bot will already know who it's talking to and be able to, so you're basically getting kind of like single sign on without them actually having to sign on. They already signed on into discord. I see. But you're also being able to, to see the NFTs that they've chosen to, to, to link to that discord handle. So like for me, Patrick algo is my NFT wallet. So for any NFT stuff, I just Patrick algo. And so I have no problems at all that being public. I want to be public. Right. But the nice thing is, is that the Discord that support that, then I can just say hi, <laughs> and I'm just automatically like connected. Mm -hmm. I might have to say like verify and type patch that algo. It, like it varies on how some of the different Discord bots handle it. But technically, I can literally just kind of like emoji click the bot, and that's it. And they can just the fact that I talked about it all, they could see what ID I have and look up that ID in the nfts and find um the, my nfd and then all mac can know all the related accounts that i've linked and search for their assets in it and give me um permissions and they're in and their discord are that. there any prominent bot providers who already sort of provide this capability yeah or? um so if you go to our integration list we got like 50 plus integrations mm -hmm. i think there's at least two is at least two discord bots um that provide this functionality awesome uh i think um, one of them is such that it's like a, a global database. I think he maintains a sort. So it's like if you verify with any of the discords that his bot is on, then those discords, those discord admins kind of register like, hey, these these are my career wallets for, for my things. And these are the roles I want. And then like once you verify once on any of his, his like his sites or in, in the sites that use him, then you're automatically verified across all of them. 
So I, I think like once you go to a different Discord, you'll already have the roles um, because it, he he monitors the NFTs across those those linked wallets. I don't know if he he necessarily follows like if you sell like technically if you sell your NFT, the act of selling your NFT wipes all metadata. I see. So um, services should like track like okay for this given NFT like who is the owner and if it's not the same owner anymore, I shouldn't really pay. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. Uh, I should uh, ignore the prior checks in a sense. I see. I'll, I'll I'll certainly make sure to also um, reference some of those uh, partner partner integrations from uh, NFD website on the also Malgo. I think there is some direct references there as well. But uh, it's uh, it's great to see that there's already you know use cases to that, and there are some uh, bot providers who who utilize this. And uh, yeah, yeah, there's quite there's, there's quite a few different little interesting integrations. And I think yeah, if you go to our our docs, there's like an integrations link and mm-hmm. it lists all of them. And I think we have the same integrations listed. There's an integrations channel on our Discord that lists yeah, the same for, ones. For the listeners out there, all of this information and the links would be provided in this description after after the episode. But uh, Patrick, to proceed and. Uh, like I, I would love to go on any, uh, you know, particular topic uh, in detail to this extent, uh, but uh, I think you know for the sake of time, and uh, you know yeah. we're going over time a bit, but uh, there's still one final question I just wanted to um, clarify in regards to the NFD, and then we will move on to the final uh, question for the episode. But uh, that particular question, and I will generalize it for the sake of time um so initially i wanted to ask on you know specific examples of um the most notable challenges while implementing the platform but um and, and you could still mention it if you want but uh, uh to, to paraphrase it i'd say like if you look at the entire development um journey so far in regards to the nfd as a platform we've been mostly talking about the things that were leveraged from the l1 on algorand such as smart contracts there was uh, stateful stateless and some uh, plans for the future roadmap as well but if you look at the entire sort of implementation journey taking into the account of course not just the contracts but then the infrastructure work for this the front end uh, client work then i'm sure there's some uh, you know there's a lot of back end uh, work associated to also uh, work in tandem with the smart contracts and to collaborate with El- Grand chain if you are to were to look on all of those different aspects of the platform what would you say was um, the area that caused the most amount of challenges uh, and you know, I, I'm asking this just because, you know, of, in, in often cases, you know, when uh, when you think that, um, I would imagine that you would say it's smart contracts, but, you know, the, often there's often cases when big platforms like this, uh, you find um, some very interesting bottlenecks or you find some very interesting challenges in something that, uh, you know, you least expected uh, the uh, sort of issues to occur. But uh, just curious to hear your take on this then. All of the above. I mean, I it's it's to have you know, to have a service that, you know, to have, I think our app is one of the, the, the best out there. Um, it performed extremely well. It worked extremely well on, on mobile devices. It, there, you know, um, it, you know, every different resolution, it, it scales and adjusts very, very well. Um, our resolutions, my UI guys have done an amazing job there. That's a lot of work. Um, so to have a performant um, DAP that works across mobile and desktop, across many wallets, that um, is, you know, it, it's, it's kind of interesting. It's, it's an interesting challenge that a lot of traditional sort of websites, like you, you log in and you mm-hmm. have like session management that we have no login. There's no, there's no login. There's no session management. It's like completely public. Like the API that we have is the API our UI uses. Um, so the the mechanisms for um, gating like state transitions in a mm-hmm, sense mm-hmm. is all the chain. So it's just a very different kind of model in the sense where like, you know, if you say, I want to change this NFD, and then the UI, it's all local. You're changing fields, and you say update. 
then that just asks our API, like, hey, we have a really, really nice API. It's you people don't have to use it. They can make direct contract calls, but you can just do an HTTP put or an HTTP patch. So if you do a put, then if I fetched an NFT, here's a JSON of the internal user-defined verified properties. I can do a put and say, here's the user-defined properties. And you could have changed, you could have added five fields, changed two, deleted one. Mm -hmm. And you just do a put with those user-defined properties and you get back a transaction group for you to sign and submit. So what happens is that, you know, the API just returns back transactions. We pop it to whatever wallet you're using. You sign and submit that. And then the back end is completely oblivious. The back end doesn't know that you signed or submitted anything. Right? Mm -hmm. You just hear some transactions and they could sign them. Or, you know, someone could have gone to a goal command line and done a goal app call and called the contract themselves from their own node. The key is, is that the changes happen on the chain. So we have a, a backend block watcher that watches every block on chain. And it, it keeps track of where it leaves off. If it gets shut down, there's deploys or whatever, mm -hmm, or if mm -hmm. it goes wrong, and it'll always start where it left off. And it reads every transaction and goes, oh, here's an, here, here an NFT was created. I'll, I'll start watching that one. Oh, here an NFT was called to update prop metadata. Okay, mm -hmm. well, what got changed? And so the only way it, the, 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 the platform or back end for our caches and all that kind of things knows that anything changed is because the blockchain changed, right? However it changed. So it's, it's a very kind of different model. It's not like, you know, like traditional, traditional web apps, yeah. you know, you're talking to a back end service and then it writes to a database, right? And then there's different caches and event buses and stuff like that. And in this case, you know, the database in a sense, it's blockchain. Now we have a database that feeds our our public API because it, it's people need, you know, millisecond access to fetch things if they want to use the API. Well, that's fed from a, a different database, but that database only ever gets updated because the blockchain got updated. So it's kind of a very different sort of model. And then the normal sort of things that you would use for like DOS attacks and DOS interventions and that sort of stuff, you don't really have. In a sense, you're, it becomes the chain. Yeah. Right? So it's like, well, yeah, I don't care if you, you know, have a bunch of transactions that you don't submit. I mean, if you want to change something, you submit, you change the chain. And the chain will get you. Um, now, I could then have you know, like rate limits and things for my API, and I can try to prevent things that way. But, you know, in terms of, um, you know, normal sort of restrictions, it is, it, it, those restrictions are into becoming things on the chain. So it's, it's, it's a matter of pushing like, oh, I want to be able to send a message to this user or whatever. Well, in some ways, you know, to do that, that ends up just being a contract call that we see. Mm-hmm. And you use the chain as that that discovery mechanism, um, and um, so that's a different model. But then it's just in general having, you know, when you have a kind of an infra level sort of a kind of a key infrastructure service that lots of different things want to use in different ways, then um, that also requires um, a much you know more robust infrastructure to be able to perform. Well, um, you know, so then you have a global CDN, you know, you have, um, you know, very efficient infrastructure services um, because um, whereas like for wallet providers, it's like, I'd like them to use the ARM chain. Like if you look at our integration docs and be like, hey, for sitting algo, just read it from our chain, please. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But, you know, a lot of times for like doing reverse lookups and all that kind of things, like hey, an Algorand node to do that would be very painful. Right. Um, so, you know, I think for doing reverse lookups, just hit our API. Right. And it'll be very fast. Um, but at the same time, for like doing like financial sends, you can trust but verify. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's like those things where it's like use the API, but also do it on chain or just do it all on chain. Because at least for that stuff, on chain is actually still quite efficient, particularly if you already know 
the application ID and like you had that stored, like, oh, this is the application ID I transact with, you could always fetch like its current state with one call to any algorand node. Yeah. And any algorand node would always be the current state. Um, and there's a bunch of nodes, including ones that are free and public at the moment. And uh, exactly, yeah, like uh, uh, um, yeah, you've our Explorer, PureStake, Algo Node, uh, Algo Nodes kind of come out of nowhere and is doing doing really well. They they they, they run they do a really good job with their nodes. Um, so it's it's great to have competition in that area. Yeah. It's good for all of us, really. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is. I would say the contracts were a challenge um, early on because there's it's just the growing pains of like I was very familiar with Algorand, like I understood, I'd followed Teal, and I understood all this stuff at work, but then mm -hmm. to actually actually start to like actually write the contracts, it's very different. Um, and, and then the so fact that it constantly changes, like just over yeah. the past year, right? There's been four oh, Teal yeah. versions. Everything that Huge. like it gets improved, exactly. but then there's things that could be a major, you know, like a sort of breaking yeah. change. If you rely on stateless contracts, then you know some Teal upgrades in the version could also change the like output hash of the yeah. contract. And there's just a lot of things you get. To, to well, or it's even the simple things like it's like, hey, you know, here's this feature that I that will totally change my my design and it's like do you do you wait for it <laughs> or do you just try to account for it and plan for it and then there's you know there's the the nuances of upgradable contracts um yeah. and I, I i see both sides to it and there's there's a lot of nuance to it to be honest i mean like i think people you know um there's people who will be like really against upgradable contracts but at the same time, they'll use a contract to begin with, and they never read the code. So it's like, well, you, right? So it's like, wait a second, you're saying you don't trust the upgraded, but but you just implicitly trust what you're calling to begin with. Like, how do you know there isn't a problem with what you're you're, you're initially calling? Um, so you know, there's always going to be. There's always going to be levels of trust. Yeah, I mean, sometimes um, ideologies are you know uh, prevailing uh, over pragmatism. <laughs> it comes to smart contracts, so. but but I, I I do I do like the the approach that kind of ended up with in some cases it ended up being happy accidents. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it is I, I do like the fact that it is the user's choice to be able to lock that. Um, I know in many cases because of these upcoming features, I hope they don't. Um, but if they do, that's fine. They'll sell the ability to unlock it and manually upgrade. It. And you know if if the time comes, um, but. Uh, you know, like, you know, one part of me once is excited about all the cool stuff we have coming. And but another part of me would is almost would be really excited to be like, okay, this, this thing is perfect. I can't, I, nothing else can happen with this, but I don't, I don't know. Um, we'll see. I know, I know there's, there's things like additional things that could happen is like right now, um, when you verify a field, that's that's there's, there's off chain processes. Like mm -hmm. you verify email, that that off chain process are involved. We're acting as kind of the trust agent in that verification process. Um, you know, so in the future, what I would love to see are um, good centralized um, oracles mm -hmm. that support off chain um, services. Um, in a decentralized you know way so it's like okay here's here's this node software like i could even like write you know like here's a verification for doing twitter or email or whatever and have that be as an add-on to you know a chain link type of service and someone could do the verification through that and then if one of those nodes then is chosen you know and is not is not slash and all that then i could allow the contracts to have that specific, you know, uh, Oracle contract update the verified verified field. I see. You know, so in the future, it'd be like, okay, well, now for Twitter verification, that's now handled by this this Oracle, and then that would be just, you know, I, I'd love to see those sort of things come off our plate. It's like I don't want those. I don't want those touch points to be on us. I, I'd prefer those touch points to be um, all on chain. But they have to be. It has to be possible first, um, and then and and then also then it has to exist. But so yeah, in the future I could see yeah. saying that this particular oracle can update this verified field and the contracts changing for things like that.
I feel like 2023 might bring a lot of that, actually, because, you know, with Algorand uh, delivering on the state proofs and now sort of switching more focus on adoption uh, in regards to cross-chain applications and Oracle, I feel like there uh, might be a lot mm -hmm. of uh, interesting yeah, stuff. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see. Year. I know, like, Gorkle is still in testnet. Um, I talked to them a little bit. I haven't talked to them a lot about I I, I, I mentioned these things. I kind of put these kind of planted the, planted the seeds them quite some time ago about being able to do some of these off-chain verifications. But I know they're they're busy. Mm -hmm. But um, I think, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we see multiple Oracle services um, on, on our grand of, of varying complexities. Um, so yeah, um, I'll either, you know, hopefully can, can, you know, use them or, you know, worst case, right one if I have to, if, if, if no one else does. But um, yeah, it's 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 been fun, and right. and so yeah, there's lots and lots of challenges. But I can go into, into that. I mean, it's the time I've already talked long enough. Um, but um, yeah, generically, a lot of contract stuff was painful early on. I think now I like mostly kind of get it, but there's still there's still times of frustration. Yeah. Um, but um, the the tooling just keeps getting better, um, and. I think what um, they're trying to do, you know, with John Wood's initiatives for things like AgoKit, um, I think AgoKit and Beaker and the that of, of, of what they're trying to do is can only help. Yeah, because uh, like there's so many tools in the ecosystem, right? But uh, sort of putting an Algorand branded umbrella over the things that Algorand delivers and essentially combining them all into a single ecosystem. Uh, I think this is uh, one of the useful ways to just increase uh, user experience with developers, right? Because uh, mm -hmm. it's all about the ease of use and the development uh, to increase the adoption in this case. But um, once again, pa Patrick, thanks again. Uh, you're a perfect guest for, for the podcast kind of uh, styled interviews. Uh, I'm I talked than... a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, this is a perfect setup, actually. Uh, but uh, you know, as a tradition in in, in Osomalgo, uh this would be the eighth episode. I, I will be uh, following and um, publishing it shortly after we finish here. But uh, usually, finish the podcast by asking for um, like if you were had a chance to give an advice for to as, aspiring software engineers. Uh, who want to try their hands on blockchain development or on Algorand or just generally get into Web3 space um, would be, you know, interested to hear your uh, advice in that case and sort of uh, suggestions for people who uh, 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 this is, this, are really this, fascinated this is, by the topic by trying to get into it in the first place. Yeah, this is kind of tough for me in some ways. It's almost like when people ask, like, oh, hey, um, you know, what school should I go to or or what language should I learn first and things like that. And, and it, it just, it's just, it always feels like people tend to reply with just what they did mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as like the, the way to do it. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say what I'll sort of think, but at the same time, I'll preface it that everyone, you know, learns differently. And, and, you know, for some people, it might be a very different path that works best for them. But, um, I think understanding how the nodes work, I think, you know, to have that foundation of kind of understanding um, it um, as low level as possible helps everything. You know, run a node, um, set a, particip a participation key, um, participate in consensus, you know, kind of see that you're participating, understand, you know, okay, why this proposal happened? Like, why am I not getting as many votes as I should? Like, statistically, I should get this many. Why am I not? Am I not, is it not being fast enough? And kind of understand, you know, networking, understand the the node, um, understand transactions. Like, run your own node, like, submit, use goal to submit your transactions. Don't use para, right? Like, so, and then that's kind of like the building blocks of, okay, if I use goal clerk send and I'm sending algo with goal, then goal is just constructing a transaction and talking to my local node and submit a transaction. So it's like kind of building blocks of, of 
what is really happening kind of under the covers with just simple things like I want to send algo or I want to opt in. And kind of goal in some ways gives you a kind of a, a still somewhat user-friendly way where you can just on the command line do it, but it's still pretty low level. And I think build build up on that to understand the different transaction types, how those fit in, and then um, the contract logic, you know, now with the sandbox, I think, now that the sandbox is being um, kind of packaged up a lot nicer, um, that does al allow you to um, start kind of playing in literally a sandbox yeah. where you can set up your own private network. Like right now with NFTs, you know, I have a bunch of Docker images. I can run like a, a, a can system test where, you know, I stand up a private network dev mode algorand instance that auto funds like six or seven accounts with hard code mnemonics. Like this is buyer one, buyer two, buyer three, this is the mm -hmm. admin account and all that. And then I even submit transactions to turn off participation rewards. Um, because I, I started wondering why some of my system tests were failing at a certain point is because you still receive participation rewards um, in dev mode. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, participation modes ended um, for the normal algorithm if I can main that. Um, but if you set your own private network, the participation pool starts with a set amount mm -hmm. and you'll still receive participation rewards. And so it's like, I did all these things to bootstrap and then it's stand up to all my services and all it's it sets up the watcher the the, the public apis the private apis the nodes um and um i'll submit the transact i'll actually call my api get the transactions sign them independently and submit them just as if it was a user using a wallet and then um uh wait until the watcher will have seen it on the blockchain and then verify against um the the node and then also against my um my other database to verify like did that get up, updated correctly and stuff mm -hmm. but um yeah for users it's really just you know just start doing you know i mean like i, I think that the best way to learn is to do and you know it's like for some people re you know you can read these read these solutions and tutorials the developer algorand site the developer.algorand.org site has tons and tons of solutions tutorials and blogs and i think they're kind of buried nowadays to be honest um but it's it's a hard problem to surface it well uh, that said there's actually really really good content there it's 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 impressive some of the stuff people have written like actually i wrote one a long 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 time ago i wrote like a a, a, a solution on exporting uh, your crypto, uh, exporting transactions for taxes. Mm -hmm. and I did that back in 2020, I think, because nothing was supporting algorithm. Oh, I, I think I remember this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and so there's a lot of, like, if you look at those, there's some really good, like, full end to end canned kind of solutions for multiple languages. So there's stuff for Go, there's stuff for, you know, TypeScript, JavaScript, Python. Um, you know, Rust, C Sharp, whatever, pick your poison. I'd say maybe go to the solutions and the tutorials. Um, and maybe that, you know, if you, I mean, that's a good way for some people is like take something that a language you already understand. Mm -hmm. Look, take one of those solutions tutorials, stand it all up and understand it. And then kind of go from there. Um, and then that and the Algorand Discord, obviously. It's it's almost kind of too busy for me. I, I'm, I'm busy, so busy with NFTs now. I, I don't, I'm not able to spend as much time there as I used to. Um, but I still try to be there and be helpful when I can. But there's definitely a lot of, of that's that's really where the technical discussions are, is on Algorand's Discord, you know, for anyone doing development. And yeah, I think the uh, the the folks there are still doing an amazing job. Like it's it's oh yeah, it's basically on demand Stack Overflow. <laughs> <It's>, uh... <laughs> yeah, I mean, but like Barnji, like I the, the, I don't I I, I keep worrying I keep worrying he's gonna burn himself out. The guy doesn't sleep. He, yeah, I, I think he needs uh, some, 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 some fleet of you know Discord automated bots to uh, <laughs> to help him a little bit with like some, incidents. Some bar he needs some Barnji bots. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> but yeah, he's uh, just to like give a shout out to him. He's doing a stellar job there as well. Uh, but, yeah, I know everything's great, and, and it's great to see more engagement. You know, it, it wasn't there at all in the past, like zero basically. And then early on, it was Jason Weathersby and Fabrice a lot of times in Discord answering questions. Um, you know, Fabrice is one of you know photographers of the foundation. He's, he's, just, he's pretty hardcore, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's you know, amazing. He's on paper. He's involved in. He's, he's fantastic. And, you know, he was like helping with almost like day to day sort of like infrastructure stuff. I think thankfully they've, they've, they're letting him focus solely on what is his core, um, yeah. you know, what he's working on. So, but now there's a lot of additional people. The DevRel team's hired. You know, you've got um, Nolan and Margie and um, what, Monopoly Joe, I think, is the foundation. Mm -hmm. You know, you have Stefan now with um, the Arc Manager. There's just, they're adding a lot more staff that's directly engaged, direct and engaged. And you're having also um, some direct developer engagement, which I think is fantastic to see. I, I've been on the other end. I know how awkward it can be as a as a developer to to kind of be customer facing in some cases it yeah. can be kind of awkward um but it, it, it is really great to see people like john Gennati, um in some of the channels and engaged um i know it's probably frustrating for him sometimes but it's it's really helpful um for the community to have access um you know to some of the the, the core engineers but i also think it's useful for them to to, to see in some cases the pain points that yeah. that the builders have Well, and with that, um, Patrick, uh, like I, I can't thank you more for, for, for this. I think uh, like the original schedule, I was trying to optimize it for sixty minutes, but we uh, went uh, beyond <laughs> yeah. my expectations. I, 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 I think I warned you, like like our our, uh, our company team meetings, we were originally supposed to be like you know fifty minute stand ups, and they tend to be like hour, hour and a half, two hours, and it's not all my fault. It's part of it. Usually, it's my fault, but it's because because we talk we we talk a lot of times we're our grand fans as well. So a lot of times our meetings end up being talking about, you know, Hey, mm -hmm. what just happened yesterday? Or mm -hmm. did you see this tweet? And then we start talking about like market conditions or like, you know, what does this really mean to have a prime minister that's, you know, pro crypto in Britain mm -hmm. and things like mm -hmm. that. And does it really, is it, does it really mean anything? And what's the CDC going to really look like? I mean, it's, so we'll go off on these tangents and then we'll also talk business and, and, you know, future plans, um, and we're always trying to, you know, gauge, you know, what features we talk about and not, because there's still a lot of stuff that hasn't really been talked about, some stuff we want to do. But, um, well, yeah. I, I'd be more than happy to, Thanks, you man. know, have you at some point after you guys are uh, going to release the features that you highlighted in the future roadmap. But, uh, aside yeah, from that, se segments, uh, hopefully, segments will hopefully be certainly live. I mean, they're kind of, like I said, they're kind of live now um for kind of private pdf mm -hmm. sort um but um they'll be more exposed and ho hopefully completely public um hopefully by end of year all right well thanks again for the uh for the content and the insights provided here uh that's uh, like amazing content basically uh for the listeners out there thank you for uh, staying with us if you survived this long i think you're a really dedicated <laughs> fan and i think at this point you you, you can be classified as uh you know as a entry level uh expert in regards to nfd system um thank you for listening